Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Elmwood, Transcona. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I rise today, uh, such as it is in the virtual parliament, to uh, speak to the uh, agreement that was signed between Canada and the United Kingdom for uh, what they're calling a trade continuity agreement and the legislation that would implement that here in Canada. It's been uh, a bit of a rocky road to get here, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I think there are a number of uh, problems with the way that this has unfolded that uh, bear description here in the House. Uh, but I want to start just by talking a little bit about the nature of trade. And, you know, this is another agreement in a vein of kind of corporate globalized trade that uh, us and the NEP recognize has not been has not been good for workers. As Canada has signed a number of these free trade agreements, whether it was the original uh, NAFTA or CETA or TPP and various reforms at the WTO, all of this has coincided with a period where a lot of good good paying jobs that fed families and provided the kinds of benefits that Canadians expect as part of a good quality of living, whether that's a decent pension or health benefits or other things that come with a good job, left the country. And it's not a coincidence that that happened as these agreements were signed that made it easier and easier for, for big corporations and, and some of the biggest economic players to move their capital around, to move their operations around, to find the, the, the place with the lowest standards for how they treat their workers, with the lowest standards for how they treat the planet. And, um, and, you know, and all of that was also done in a context, Mr. Speaker, where the taxes that those folks pay were continually being reduced as well. So what we saw was a period where working Canadians lost a lot of their good employment that provided them with a good livelihood, while the people at the top were able to move their assets around and keep more and more of the economic pie for themselves. It hasn't worked out well for everyday Canadian workers, and it's why we don't like the model. That doesn't mean we don't like trade. I mean, the NEP is very well aware of all of the opportunities that exist for Canadian businesses, including some of our small businesses, when, when trade is done right, in order to be able to expand their reach. It's just that we want to see agreements that allow that to translate not into gross profits for a few Canadians who are at the top, but to translate into more good quality jobs for Canadian workers who are then going to produce the things that get traded with other countries. If it just means that all the value-added work goes somewhere else, uh, that's, that's not, I think, in the ultimate interests of Canadians. And I think there's a fair bit of evidence to suggest that that has been the trend over the last 30 years or so. And um, so why, why am I talking about that? Well, trade between Canada and the United Kingdom is, is as old as, uh, as, as the as, as Canada with Europeans, <laughs> at least, and, um, and we've had a long-standing trade relationship. It's an important one. I think that a lot of the similarities and affinities between Canada and the United Kingdom provide for creating a real gold standard trade agreement, one that actually, and, and even if you, if you listen, even to the, to the conservatives in the United Kingdom talk more about uh, climate change and I think have, have made more of putting climate change at the forefront of their new trade agenda than even the Liberals here uh, have done. I think there's a real opportunity to, to work with them and others in the United Kingdom to create a gold standard deal that takes seriously the impacts of globalized trade for climate change and seeks to control and reduce those impacts. I think we have an opportunity to create a gold standard deal that takes seriously the rights of workers and, and human rights and seeks to actually, uh, you know, incorporate those in, into the deal, not in a side letter that isn't enforceable, but actually into the core of the deal to ensure that workers are getting fairly treated and to ensure that the wealth, the, if there is additional wealth created by an increase of trade between our two countries, that that finds its way to workers and not just to the people at, at the uh, top. I would also hope that, uh, that our good relationship with the United Kingdom would allow for an agreement that recognizes and takes seriously the rights uh, and role of Indigenous people in Canada so that those aren't, uh, so that we don't run roughshod over those in the way that an agreement is concluded. But we don't have that here, Mr. Speaker. What we have 
is after knowing that this was coming for a long, long time, we have effectively a carbon copy of CETA, which was an agreement in that corporate model that I just described that we don't agree with. Well, we didn't agree with it at the time because uh, we knew that an agreement like CETA and the intellectual property provisions were going to put up upward costs on the price of pharmaceutical drugs in Canada at a time when, we're, when, when we already pay among the highest price for prescription drugs in Canada. In, in the uh, Western world, why would we be concluding an agreement that makes those drugs more expensive? Why then would we carbon copy that agreement when we have an opportunity to do something different with our largest trading partner in the European Union, representing about 40% of our trade with Europe? That doesn't make sense to new Democrats who have been elected to Parliament on a mission to reduce the price of prescription drugs for Canadians. It doesn't make sense when we think about the integrity of our democratic institutions. These same corporate trade deals have also put serious uh, limits and inhibitions on democratically elected governments to regulate in the public interest. And uh, that was also part of our initial uh, opposition to CETA, the investor state dispute settlement mechanisms. Now, I recognize that those will not come into force immediately upon the passage of this legislation, but I find it shocking, frankly, that they're even in there at all. Because we haven't heard the British government talk about the need for investor state dispute settlement clauses. Those are the clauses that have allowed foreign corporations to sue the Canadian government for hundreds of millions of dollars over the last 30 years. Those are the same clauses that the Deputy Prime Minister herself recently in the House last June said that one of the biggest achievements she was proud of in the COSMA negotiations was that the investor state resolution system, and I'm quoting now, Mr. Speaker, which in the past allowed foreign companies to sue Canada will be gone. And yet, here they are again, not because our trading partner was asking for them. So how did they even get into the agreement? If Britain doesn't want them and Canada doesn't want them, why are they there? And why would it be possible to have them come into effect, which is the default after three years, incidentally, Mr. Speaker, if another decision isn't taken in the meantime. So we object to the idea that these would be present at all, and I'm interested to know who at the table was concerned to put them in there, given that uh, you know our government was uh, trying to take credit for having uh, signed an agreement with the United States and Mexico that finally got rid of them, which we thought was a good thing. The other thing that CETA did, of course, which we opposed, was attack, further attack the supply-managed uh, sectors in Canada, which, you know, we heard comments earlier that I, that I agree with completely. I mean, you know, the way we procure our food and supplying our food, it's not a commodity like any other. And we want to make sure that our agricultural producers are compensated fairly for what they produce. We want to be able to support those local producers. And we want to make sure that our food supply chain is secure. All these agreements tend toward a more globalized food supply chain. And if the pandemic has taught us anything, it's that when it comes to the things that really matter that you can't do without, you shouldn't be depending on international supply chains. Supply management in Canada is a great tool to ensure that our local producers are, are paid fairly for the work they do, can stay in business, and that Canadian consumers can get the products they need to eat at a fair price reliably. So those were things that we didn't like about CETA. We had lots of time, and we knew for a long time. In fact, I mean... Frankly, when it came to signing CETA in the first place, it was a mystery to us in the NDP that the government was rushing ahead. The Conservatives had negotiated this deal. The Liberals came into power. In the meantime, Britain decided to have a referendum on whether or not they'd remain in the European Union. New Democrats thought that it might be significant to the nature of trade between Europe and Canada whether the United Kingdom was part of Europe or not, considering that it represented about 40% of our trade with Europe. And it still strikes me as just totally ridiculous that the government decided to go ahead and pen a deal with Europe when uh, we didn't know and subsequently have found out that they're leaving, that 40% of, of uh, trade with Europe wasn't going to be captured by that deal. And it does raise problems. We'll see what happens as we try to negotiate a successor agreement to this, to this one. Uh, what that means for the supply managed sector. New Democrats are very concerned that there are further concessions in, in the offing. And uh, we, we will believe it when we see it, that that's not really on the table for the Liberals, because we've seen them break that promise before. 
the other thing that I think bears mentioning when it comes to CETA is that, and I'm going to quote now Mr. Speaker from a report called Taking Stock of CETA, Early Impacts of the EU-Canada Comprehensive Economic Trade Agreement. One of the things to know, Mr. Speaker, and I quote, between September 2017 and May 2019, total Canadian exports to the EU measured monthly were essentially flat. Meanwhile, over the same period, total imports from the EU increased by over a third, 33.8%. This imbalance has resulted in a doubling of the monthly Canadian trade deficit with the European Union from $1.51 billion in September 2017 to $3.43 billion in May 2019. In recent decades, the United Kingdom is the only major European country with which Canada has consistently run a trade surplus, but since September 2017, the Canadian merchandise trade surplus with the UK has shrunk significantly, falling by two-thirds with exports declining by 32%, while imports rose 14%. I mean, here's an assessment of the deal and whether it's working for Canada. The governments didn't bother to negotiate a different agreement. They're asking for a carbon copy of an agreement that has seen Canada's trade deficit with Europe increase. So even the empirical evidence on the deal so far suggests that this hasn't been a wondrous deal for Canada. Now, I have a lot of sympathy for Canadian businesses who want that certainty in an uncertain time. I think the government really let them down in terms of the process, but they didn't just let them down in November and, and December when they failed to get this legislation before the House and passed before December 31st. They let them down a long time ago when they walked away from the negotiating table and weren't even trying to negotiate the kind of gold standard deal that I spoke about earlier or any kind of different deal at all. Uh, and so here we find ourselves, we're past deadline. Uh, these businesses have already gone through that jarring uncertainty and what it means for their uh, business, business model. And, uh, and I, you know, so I understand their disappointment. I think the government ought to have behaved in a way to try and provide a lot more certainty about what was coming. But I do think it's also a disappointment that in addition to that, all we're getting is the same as what we got in CETA with all of the problems that were there and with all the evidence that shows that this hasn't been a deal that's working out very well for Canada. I would say one of the, perhaps one of the only redeeming aspects of this entire farce of a process around negotiating our post-Brexit trade relationship with the United Kingdom is that it afforded an opportunity for certain committees of the House to reaffirm our commitment to the Good Friday Agreement, which was something that Canada played an important role in uh, brokering. And uh, New Democrats, myself and, and, uh, and my colleague from, from St. John's at the Foreign Affairs Committee presented motions at the International Trade Committee and the Foreign Affairs Committee that passed, I'm glad to say unanimously, affirming Canada's support for the wants to be part of a trade relationship with the United Kingdom that in no way jeopardizes the uh, Good Friday Agreement and in fact seeks to reinforce the peace that was hard won in the 90s. And I think that's maybe one of the only silver linings to what otherwise was a terrible process. I mean, there was no real meaningful consultation with, with businesses, with unions, with, Can with Canadian civil society on what this trade relationship ought to look like. And I stress again, that because the government, I think, is you know likes to talk as if this deadline snuck up on us or like we didn't know this was coming. It's been years that we've known that Britain was leaving uh, the EU, and it was incumbent upon the government of the day to to do the work so that whenever that deadline came, there was something in uh, there was actually something in place, and yet there wasn't really any meaningful public consultation process on this. The Trade Committee on its own initiative held some hearings in this, in this parliament, but of course, like many things due to the pandemic, that was severely interrupted. It doesn't explain why there wasn't some effort by the government in the years leading up to that to try and engage people meaningfully on the question of the Canada-UK trade agreement or to try to involve parliament for that matter. So. I would say this, oh, and I, I'd just like to add about this agreement. While we're talking about the kind of abomination of process that is this deal, I think it bears mentioning that the government will talk about this as a transitional deal, 
And I, I think that's misleading. Now, I get that our partner in the, in the United Kingdom and the Canadian government have perhaps committed in good faith, and it's in the agreement for all to read, that they're going to start negotiating towards a successor deal within a year. And I think there's some expectation that within three years that deal will be concluded. There's a couple things that will get more difficult after that three-year time horizon if a successor deal has not been concluded. But the fact remains, Madam Speaker, that a transitional deal implies a temporary deal. And the fact that it's a transitional deal and the fact that it's essentially a carbon copy of CETA are the reasons for which the government says we shouldn't be too concerned that there hasn't been a great process around it all. Because don't worry, we're going we're gonna to negotiate another deal and it's really just like what we had. Well, what we had had problems. The NEP is not satisfied with CETA. The NEP does not agree that CETA is the be-all, end-all of, of a trade agreement anyway. And I, and I tell you, there's a lot of Canadian workers across the country who feel the same way. But even that notwithstanding, when you talk about a transitional deal, it implies a temporary deal. There's nothing temporary about this deal. Once this deal goes through, and it's already been signed, I mean, the government's done, they've done the deed. This legislation, I gather from, uh, from the debate today, is, is going gonna, is gonna to pass. The Democrats will be voting against it. But it is going to pass, and it's going to pass in a timely way. Um, and if that successor agreement, we all know, I mean, after what we just went through with Donald Trump and the pandemic and everything else, we all know that three years is a long time in politics and a lot can change. And good intentions sometimes don't bear the fruit that people thought. If in three years' time, Canada and the UK do not conclude a successor agreement, this is what we're stuck with. And we'll have been stuck with it after no meaningful engagement with the Canadian public or the Canadian parliament, except this debate. And whatever process is going to ensue at committee, something that we're being asked to hurry up with and rush, and something that the government has created a context where there is a legitimate need to act, to act with some uh, swiftness, because Canadian businesses uh, haven't had any opportunity to plan for an alternative, even though I think an alternative could have served Canadians better. So there's no sunset clause in the deal. There's no sunset clause in this legislation. There's no, in other words, there's nothing that compels Canada in the UK in any strong sense to conclude a successor agreement that might realize the potential for that gold standard in trade rather than just repeating the same old corporate model that has not been serving Canadians well over the last 30 years. And I, I, to me, that's a real disappointment. And I caution Canadians to know that this isn't just some kind of transitional thing that's going away anytime soon. It's only going away anytime soon if it becomes a priority of our government and the government of the UK and, the, and political circumstances allow for them to conclude a deal. And we've all seen, I mean, if you think back to where we were three years ago, nobody would have predicted what's happened in the interim. And I think it would be a shame if this is the deal that Canada gets stuck with to define our trading relationship with Canada and the United Kingdom, because I think we can do a heck of a lot better, Madam Speaker. I think we can do better when it comes to not having any provisions at all, like the investor state dispute settlement provisions that cost Canadian taxpayers money and limit the ability of their democratically elected governments to regulate uh, in the public interest. I think it would be a shame if we didn't get an agreement with the UK that takes climate change seriously and tries to mitigate the effects of globalized trade. I think it would be a shame if we didn't get an agreement with the UK that really recognizes in some kind of meaningful and enforceable way the rights of Indigenous people in Canada. I think it would be a shame if we didn't get an agreement that took upward pressure on prescription drug costs seriously. I mean, at the very least, if the Liberals are going to continue to sign deals like this, they could get a national pharmacare plan in place and going to help do something that would bring those pharmaceutical drug prices down for Canadians, both in terms of their out-of-pocket costs, but also the incredible costs on uh, provincial government ledgers for those uh, pharmacare programs at, at the provincial level that don't benefit from the purchasing power of the entire country. So I hope we're going to get there. That's certainly where our emphasis is going to be, Madam Speaker. But in the meantime, it's, it's hard to say yes to a deal that is as unimaginative and part of a, a, a broken international trade culture. Thank you very much.
Questions and comments? Questions and commentaires? The Honorable Member for Winnipeg North. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. You know, Canada is a trading nation. We need international trade. Uh, we cannot underestimate the importance of that global trading uh, market. And uh, I'm not surprised, a little disappointed. The, the NDP consistently uh, vote against trade agreements. They seem to be of the opinion the way you uh, get a trade agreement is you just say what it is you want and then you wait for the other country to agree to it or you don't have an, an agreement. And my question to the, my friend and colleague from uh, Winnipeg is that would he not recognize the, the, the actual value of international trade for Canadian society as a whole and indicate to those that might be following the debate what trade agreements uh, historically have the NDP actually stood in their place and voted for? Honourable Member for Elmwood, Transcona. Well, it seems to me the Honourable Member has the memory of a goldfish. The last trade agreement that was before the House, the Canada-United States-Mexico agreement, was an agreement that we voted for. There were tangible wins for Canadian workers. We got rid of the investor state dispute settlement clauses I was just talking about that somehow reappeared here. And it's not because the British government was asking for it. So who was presumably the only other partner in the agreement, the Canadian government. Otherwise I don't see why they'd be there. We also got rid of the energy proportionality clause, which was just, which never should have been signed in the first place and was a, a, a serious uh, problem when it comes to Canada's energy sovereignty. That's something, you know, that's been the subject of a lot of debate in the house just recently, but of course, you know, uh, conservatives didn't care a whit about Canadian energy sovereignty when they when they negotiated NAFTA back then, and I was glad to see that go. So yeah, when we can point to tangible wins for real Canadians, not just the guys at the top, we're prepared to vote for agreements. But man, do they ever come sparsely, Madam Speaker? And it's because we've got liberals and conservatives both that are happy to run around the world figuring out how quickly they can sell out everyday Canadians. Uh, to do a solid for the corporate buddies. And the trends are there. You just have to look at the evidence. Well, member for Oshawa. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I want to thank my colleague. I enjoyed working with him on international trade on the very agreement that he was speaking about, the, the Kuzma. And that's, I wanted to ask him because he did bring forward um, initiatives for greater transparency in trade agreements, which we did support him on. Um, with the Kuzma, we asked to see economic impact studies. The government refused. Um, even yesterday, I think the Prime Minister is still saying it was a better agreement than NAFTA, even though CD said it would be a $10 billion hit to our economy, a uh, $1.5 billion hit to our uh, auto industry. I was wondering if he knows negotiation, with, because I'm no longer on that committee, did he see any change as far as openness and transparency and engagement of important uh, Canadian stakeholders? Point of order. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, the Honourable Member. Uh, we don't have interpretation. Uh, je pense que honorable... I believe that the Honourable Member... Well, is that what you wanted to bring forward? The sound is poor. I don't know if my colleague could move the microphone closer to his mouth. I think it's it, his internet connection that is problematic because it's been choppy. Oshawa, could you try speaking again so we can see if we can hear you better? Yes, Madam Speaker, I want to uh, thank the member for pointing that out. Is it any better right now? Est-ce que ça fonctionne? Est que... Is it working now? Is the sound better now? Pardon? Sorry? The interpretation can hear now. Thank you. Okay, you can proceed, uh, the Honourable Member for Oshawa. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I wanted to thank my colleague. I enjoyed working with him on international trade. My question was about openness and transparency. He moved different initiatives forward to improve openness and transparency and consultation with trade agreements. I remember with Kuzma, uh, we found out after the fact that the new Kuzma would be a $10 billion hit to the Canadian economy, 1.5 billion decreased auto exports. And even as of yesterday, the Prime Minister is saying it's a better overall agreement for Canada. Does this member see any changes that have occurred with the new agreement 
as compared to the Kuzma agreement. Have they put anything in place to improve the process? We have to uh, go to the Honourable Member for Elmwood, Transcona. Well, uh, thank you very much for the uh, question. And the answer is, I mean, the answer is that the process around this deal has been very bad. I think for me, the, the, the real frustration there is that a lot of the justifications for the fact that there wasn't a lot of public consultation that there, uh, or engagement about the deal was that it's really just maintaining the status quo for now and we're going to get this new deal. That to me all along suggested that it really would be a temporary deal. And I was shocked to see that there was no sunset clause. Now I've heard liberals at committee say, oh, well, you know, a hard deadline creates drama and everything else. But if they're really, could, they could have set the timeline at whatever they wanted, could have been three years, could have been five years. If they're confident that they really are going to conclude a deal, then ending this deal automatically shouldn't have been an issue. And that provides the real incentive that you need to get a successor agreement. And uh, I'm concerned that we've had a very bad process now for what could end up being a permanent agreement. And uh, so I, I do want to see the government acting soon on the changes that the NDP negotiated to our trade process and giving notice to Parliament so we can get that process underway. The Honourable Member for Jonquière. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I have a quick question from my colleague about the transparency. I remember with CUSMA, we were the only ones to vote against it because it was absolutely, there was one thing that was unacceptable namely the aluminum status. And they abandoned us along the way because they selected to reach a deal with the Deputy Prime Minister because they would would receive intentions uh, 90 days before the next negotiations and 30 days before negotiations were underway. But now I'm wondering if my colleague has the impression that they were taken for a ride with that deal with the uh, Deputy Prime Minister. Well, I think the proof is going to be in the pudding on this on this next agreement, whether the government was negotiating in uh, in uh, good faith or not. Um, what the government would say again, and and this is I'm going to come back to the to, to the frustration I was just referring referring to earlier, is that the the process uh, wasn't very good around this. Ex but they say, well, we were already kind of negotiating long before, which was true. But then they suspended negotiations, so then it's not clear whether a new negotiation was started in August of last year or whether it was resuming a previous negotiation that was already underway. So it's the waters are muddy there. What I think is important is that the government begin to follow that process early on with respect to this new agreement. And I also felt it was important that this agreement actually be a temporary agreement. If all those other things are true, that, that this wasn't a great process, but it was just about maintaining the status quo until we get a successor agreement, the government shouldn't be signing what is, for all intents and purposes, a permanent agreement. That, to me, is the real fact. The, other, the Honourable Member for Edmonton Stratcone. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I want to thank my colleague from Elmwood, Transcona, for his, for his um, intervention. Um, he's a very important voice, of course, in international trade, and I want to thank him for his work and his expertise and, and his mentoring for, for me on this, on this file. He started his intervention today by describing the deal as bad for workers. And uh, we have uh, the Honourable Member for, um, for Edmonton uh, Stratcona. We have an, an issue again with interpretation. Um, okay. Can you perhaps unplug and replug your uh, your headset? Uh, Can you try again, please? Can you try again, please? Uh, say a few sentences. Say a few sentences if you don't mind. The member started his intervention by describing this deal as bad for workers. Yes, it seems to be working. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Proceed. Um, and the, the fact that this deal allows for a race to the bottom that creates, you know, increased inequality that benefits big corporations, but that hurts Canadian workers. I just wanted to ask the member how he would propose that we better protect workers in Canada. How would this trade deal be improved if the government had done what they promised and consulted extensively with Canadians, Canadian workers and, and the opposition party uh, like the NDP? Well, member for Elmwood Transcona. Well, thank you very much for that question. I think, you know, one of the things that I'll zero in that's that's true of CETA and will therefore also be true of this 
uh, current agreement, is the way that it opened up uh, local government procurement at the provincial and municipal level to uh, essentially say that over a certain threshold for projects, local governments aren't able to have local content requirement or to prefer or to prefer local contractors. So, I mean, that's one of the tools that subnational governments use in order to make sure that Canadian tax dollars spent here in Canada generate work for Canadian workers. And that's something that this agreement makes harder to do. CETA was unprecedented in drilling down past the national level and making it harder for other governments to be able to have that kind of localized spending as part of their infrastructure programs, for example. Um, and so I think that's one of those things that we absolutely should, should have been looking at again. I come from the construction industry. I've heard a lot of stories about uh, workers being brought in from Europe in order to in order to do construction projects in Winnipeg. 